on today's story beat. Go to college, two year, four year, doesn't matter, and don't major in drama. Major in a liberal art or a science, political science, English, history, music, anything, anything you want. And at the same time, audition for every single role in the drama department. If you can graduate with a degree in the liberal arts, which will prepare you for your future life, and you were cast in a number of plays in the drama department without being a member of the drama department, then you may have a future in theater. Then consider a conservatory. The, the, the education you get in the liberal arts will not only prepare you for life, it will prepare you for theater as well. You will learn to write, you will learn to read, you will learn history, you will learn how to research, you'll be well prepared for theater. And your natural talent, which you've shown you have by the fact that you got cast in a number of plays, will, will serve you well when you go to conservatory. Unless you're absolutely gorgeous or absolutely handsome, then you could probably go to Hollywood and become a star. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Well, you're likely to already be a fan of my guest today, Dakin Matthews, who's familiar to audiences the world over. He's an actor, playwright, dramaturge, teacher, director, translator, emeritus English professor, and Shakespeare scholar. Dakin was a founding member of John Houseman's The Acting Company and of Sam Mendes' Bridge Project. He's been a leading actor in over 250 professional plays, eight on Broadway, including recently Waitress and To Kill a Mockingbird. Dakin is a member of both the Motion Picture and TV Academies and has appeared in over 30 feature films, including True Grit, Bridge of Spies, and Lincoln, and over 300 television episodes, including shows such as The Gilded Age, the King of Queens, Desperate Housewives, The Office, and Gilmore Girls. He's been the artistic director of four professional theater companies. His multiple award-winning scripts, adaptations, translations, and originals have been performed across the country. Dakin won a Drama Desk Award for his Broadway adaptation of Shakespeare's Henry IV. His 11 rhyming verse translations of Golden Age comedies are currently being published by Lingua Text. He's taught and directed across the U.S. and has dramaturged Shakespeare for the country's leading directors. Dakin's also given workshops in Shakespearean verse speaking across the country and around the world based on his handbook, Shakespeare Spoken Here. So for those reasons and many more, it's my great honor and true privilege to welcome the extraordinarily multi-talented Dakin Matthews to Storybeat today. Dakin, welcome to the show. I thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Oh, it is a great pleasure to have you. Trust me. So let's go back in time just a little bit. You've been at this game in the business of show for quite some time at this point. Where did the bug first hit you? When did you first start thinking about being an actor or writer or whatever? Yeah, my story is is kind of weird. So you just have to sort of, you know, when people ask me for advice about it, I say, but you know, my my career path is so weird. What happened was that I never I never intended to be an actor. I'm very much an accidental actor. I was always assuming that I would be a teacher. I, I think I was, in fact, I had finished my education and I was going to graduate school and uh, in English after taking degrees already in philosophy and theology. And I was teaching algebra and religion, of all things, at a, at a Catholic high school in hmm. uh, in the Bay Area, and a colleague of mine, another teacher in the high school, and I became friends. He was in the English department. And I had mentioned to him that though I'd never studied drama, I used to act extracurricularly when I was in college, and that I had played Falstaff in Henry IV, part one. Right. Which was, which was fun. And he said, well, I see that they're auditioning for that show in a local Shakespeare festival in Marin County. Why don't you go audition for it? And I said, oh, no, that's silly. I don't, that's, I just worked in school. I wasn't even a drama major. 
And he sort of challenged me to do it. So I did. I had never auditioned for anything. And I didn't know quite what was involved in auditioning. But so I dressed up in a in a blue suit. <laughs> and, I, and I had all the only Shakespeare book I had was the big uh, Rockwell Kent illustrated Shakespeare, that gigantic complete works. And I show up for my audition with this giant Shakespeare book and my blue suit and my brown shoes and it's outdoors and it's like a hundred degrees. <laughs> and I, you know, I read my stuff and lo and behold, they offered me the job. They offered me full stuff in before part one. And I had never worked professionally or summer professionally before. And so I thought about it and I thought, well, well this is not a bad idea because I was hoping to teach English. And eventually the next year I was hired as a, as a professor, as an assistant professor at a, a local college. I thought, well, I can, I can study, I can teach and study Shakespeare during the academic year. And then every summer or so I could go act in some Shakespeare and get to learn more about it that way. Uh, so that sounded like a good idea. And I did that for about five or six years, I guess, acted in Shakespeare festivals in the summer and taught full time in the academic year. And then in order to work at one of them, they, I had to turn professional. So I got my equity card. That was 52, three years ago. I guess. Okay. And then I started getting offers from theaters uh, to work during the academic year. I thought, well, that's not going to work out. And But I went to my chairman and, and I had a really good the, uh, draw English department. I was teaching English who always considered my theatrical work as professional activity, like publishing. So I said, I'm getting some interesting offers to work in professional theater during the academic year. And some of them I really like to do because I could learn a lot more. And so I said, how about if I teach all the eight o'clock classes five days a week, which college professors don't do. As you know, they usually teach two days a week or three days a week. So I'll teach all the eight o'clock classes, even if it means teaching freshman English. And, uh, and then I'll do my theater when they offer me jobs in the afternoon and evening. He said, that's fine. I'm sure all the other professors would love it if you would take all the eight o'clock classes. <laughs> sure. So I did that for about 10 or 15 more years. I would teach from eight, eight to 12 and rehearse from one to five and wow. perform from seven to 11 in the, in the San Francisco Bay area. I put a lot of miles on my little Volkswagen bug. You know, I went anywhere in the Bay area that they would hire an actor. And, uh, and eventually it came to the point where the, I was offered an early retirement from the, from the, from the university. And I thought, well, maybe I'll take it and and do this acting thing for real. So that's that's how it happened for me. So, so I, I taught for 10 years. I can't even picture teaching every day and then going off and working all night. You, you were getting no sleep, basically. Not much, and I but I was putting miles on that bug. I tell you, I got a bug sitting. I still have the bug, and it's sitting in my driveway, and I think the, the odometer is broken. I think it's got a half a million miles on it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> So did you take acting classes somewhere or did you just no, do it? No, I never did. I trained the, the, the you know, I was right at the cusp. Con conservatory training was just coming in when I started out. And so I sort of studied, as John Housen would say, the old fashioned way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you would sign on as a younger member of, a, of an existing festival or company uh, or, or theater, and you would play small roles and you would watch the senior members how they did it and learn from them basically and then you watch a lot of movies and television and watch the actors that you really like and see how they do it so i learned by i learned by doing which is the way you know actors young actors used to learn their craft sure before the whole conservatory movement came so was there a point in doing it, clearly, if you didn't have any training, you had nothing to compare it to except each production that you were involved in. Did Was there a point where you went and thought to yourself, you know what, I am actually pretty good at this. This is something I can do. When did that happen? Yeah, what happened was I got, uh, I, I was especially fortunate that I got um, attached to a company and a couple of directors and some actors in the South Bay area, Santa Clara, Los Gatos area. And it turned out that there was a crop of really good young actors, including, for example, David Ogden Stiers and mm -hmm. Kurtwood Smith and Elizabeth Huddle and a couple of others. We were all in our like 20s 
and we had a couple of uh, directors or you know who sort of knew what they were doing and we we were all doing like five plays or six plays every summer and i remember when i realized that theater would be a, a wonderful profession and that it was possible even in places you wouldn't expect it for there to be really great acting I'll tell this story because it's part of what the beginning of my career was. I got this part of, Henry, of Falstaff in Henry IV, and we were playing in, in Marin County in an outdoor amphitheater. And uh, I was working with one of my oldest friends now, Wilmar, the great Will Marchetti, who's, uh, who has been running the Marin Theater Company, who had been running the Marin Theater Company for many, many years. He was playing Hotspur and I was playing Falstaff. And we heard that there was this little college production of Henry IV Part One being done in Santa Clara. And our reviews came out the same day. And we got great reviews. And they got kind of, oh, these college kids, they don't really know what they're doing. So I suggested that we, that we get a bus and our company all go down and watch their show. I thought that would be kind of fun to see what the kids were doing, you know, while we were the kind of grown-ups. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a bus and we drove down to, to, to Santa Clara. They didn't even have a proper theater. They had two Quonset huts in a parking lot, <laughs> which they called the lifeboat because their theater, I think, which is originally called the ship had burned down or something. So they had this temporary theater called the lifeboat. Right. And we went in to see this Henry IV part one and we were sitting in like bleachers on two sides of a stage that thrust right down the middle. We thought, well, oh, that was sort of weird. And this show started and it was the most magnificent production I had <laughs> ever seen in my life up to this time. That was glorious. It was gorgeous. It was moving. It was, it was muscular. It was brilliant, you know. And it was a very quiet bus ride home for me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to be riding home gloating about how good we were. And I thought, oh, I, I want to do that. That's that's the kind of actor I want to be. <laughs> and and obviously you went off and had and a couple that. of years later, they invited me to join their company. And it went more professional and moved into a better theater and stuff like that. But there there were these young actors there who now, all, many of whom went on to very good careers in film and television and, and, and on the stage. And I was very fortunate to be in that group. I mean, working with David Ogden Styers, who was the greatest actor on stage I've ever worked with. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, bar none. There was never anyone that I thought was greater. I've worked with some fabulous actors and they are, you know, they're great, but David was as good as anybody who's ever worked, especially in comedy, but he could do it all. Well, say that you saying that is amazing because clearly, if you look at your resume, you've worked with some astonishing actors. <laughs> I just, I just, I, I, I have, I've been very, very fortunate. So that was, that, that, that's what I mean. It was sort of accidental. I didn't really mean to become an actor, but every once in a while, if you see a performance that just knocks you out, you say, Oh, I want to aspire to that. This is what's possible, you know? For the listeners who may not know who David Ogden Stiers was, um, just check out MASH, the television series MASH, yeah. Yeah. and or check out Beauty and the Beast, the animated movie, because he's in that too. Before that, for example, he played King Lear already three times, once when he was 23, once when he was 27, which I was fortunate to be in with him. And once again, when he was in his early 30s and he was a brilliant King Lear, but he was also one of the funniest physical clowns I've ever I've ever worked with. How so, do you play Lear at 23? Brilliantly, if you're David Ogden Stiers. I mean, <laughs> I was weeping. I went, he did that the following year, as a matter of fact, after I had first come down, I went down to see, see them again the following year when I was doing Shylock back at Marin Festival. And David was playing King Lear and Grimio in Taming of the Shrew. Oh, my. He was the funniest Grimio I'd ever seen. I remember I, I went backstage because I, ha I hadn't met them yet. So I wanted backstage to see them. And I overheard someone saying, you know, there was this fat guy in the, in the second row who literally fell out of his chair into the aisle. And you were so funny. And I said, yeah, that was me. That was me. David was the funniest actor I'd ever seen. And then two weeks later, I saw his Lear and he just reduced me to tears. Clearly, you've done an 
massive amount of theater, but you've also done a significant amount of on-camera work. Do you have a preference between stage and camera, or is it not matter? Well, I you? think I would I would always prefer to do theater. I think you know it's why like, is that? Oh, well, for me, theater is like uh, athletics. If you train to be an athlete, and I'm not athletic, but I mean, in a sense, what I'm like the famous I forget who it is said that that uh, actors are emotional athletes. If you train for theater. It's the most intense exercise of your talent you can have. So film and television doesn't give you that reward. The reward it gives you is uh, is a higher profile, obviously, and uh, and and more money. Uh, in fact, the reason I started doing television and film was originally. Now I'll, I'll give you another phase of my life. Here I am having done regional theater for about 25 years. I was now at ACT in San Francisco. Right, right. And playing nice roles. But I look around and I see now all of a sudden the roles that I've been training myself to play are going to other people. Mm. People who have left theater, gone to Hollywood, gotten themselves some cue, you know, some profile, and now are being invited back into the regional theaters to play the leading roles that I've been training myself to play. <laughs> so I think I better go down to Hollywood and get some get some cue, basically, so I can come back to the theater and do 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 the roles that I really want to do. So you can know. become a bit of a name that yeah, is, is yeah. attractive to audiences. Yeah, yeah. Some something way. something not just somebody not just regional, but with a rather you know, a more national reputation. Also, a profile, a high profile. The number of kids, and I was looking forward to college fees, so I thought it wouldn't hurt to, to make a little more money. Well, as they say, you can, in the theater, you can't make a living, but you can make a killing. <laughs> but you, you got, all the great actors wind up doing movies or TV at some point because that's where the money is. Yeah, almost all, yeah. Let's talk about acting in specific for a while. What do you think makes a good role good? What separates out something that's truly impressive and attractive and actors want to play it from a lot of parts that are, you know, they'll play them, an actor will play them, but they may not be that great. Well, for me, it's almost always the language because I'm a classically trained actor and I, and I look for not just, um, not just the depth of characterization, but how that is expressed in language. For me, that's always what's what's most attractive it's not that not necessarily the number of lines or the size of the role it's the it's the intensity of the language and the not just the beauty of the language but how it just seems to capture the personality and the situation perfectly you know tony kushner has that quality mm -hmm. his language is is seemingly conversational but it hits the mark so perfectly in terms of the characters and the situations they are in that the language just, it makes acting so much easier when the language is so perfect, you know what I mean? So for me, that's, that's what draws me to great roles. Is, it's, um, it's, it's what Shakespeare says about it falling trippingly off the tongue, yes? Well, to some extent, it's that strange mix of authentic human speech somehow elevated so that it becomes at the same time incredibly dense. Do you know what I mean by that? I, I do. I, let me put it this way. Whenever you talk to somebody, you have an idea in your head that you're trying to get to them. And so you use language and you send it out there and it gets into their ear and then into their head. But you're pretty sure that it, you haven't quite got everything that was in your head into the language, into the other guy's head. Sure. You keep trying to make the language denser and denser and denser so that you achieve more of the goal, which you have is to let the other person not only understand what I'm thinking, but almost feel what I'm feeling. You know what I mean? Well, that seems to be the trick for the great playwrights and the great screenwriters is to make the language feel real while somehow, I'll use the word loosely, poetic, or it has yeah. a rhythm or some something about it that elevates it above common speech, but yet feels common. Right, right. I mean, nobody talks the way Albie's characters talk. Nobody talks no. the way old cowards give you a talk. Nobody really talks the way Mammoth's people talk, and nobody talks the way Shakespeare talks. This all involves a concentration and a selection and a and a finesse and a perfecting of the language. And I, that that's theater is is the art of language in many in many ways where sure. you know, film and television is the 
art the vi- as a visual art. visual sure uh, i just uh, had the great fortune to see stoppard's new play leopoldstadt on broadway oh my goodness the language is unbelievable it's i mean we're talking about a very very mature writer who yeah really knows how to knock it out of the park with words. And and there you have it. So when you get a script, when you've booked a role, aside from the obvious, which is to read the script, where do you start? What do you start to look at? How do you develop a character? What's your process? Boy, you know, I, I can talk about what my process used to be, which is, you know, to study it and to, to, to try to figure out what the playwright or what the screenwriter had in mind. What's the voice? that I think was in the in the playwright's head that he wants me to sort of capture. But I, I realize I've been doing it so long now that it, it's become kind of second nature. So I now tend to like pick up a script and the the voice and character sort of come out of me as it were unbidden. Do you Does that, I mean? Are you saying like a writer eventually, like I know for myself as a writer, I've been writing for 40 plus years, and it took me maybe 20 years before I felt like I had a voice that was my voice. Is that what you're saying similarly as an actor? Similarly, but also, I'm you know, I, when I write, every once in a while, the characters take over the writing. If I write, oh, uh, definitely, plays. definitely. You know, that, it's that same feeling that somehow at this, what, what I think a great actor who loves language has to do is become so flexible an instrument and so ready to become the characters that the characters reveal themselves through the language without your having to work on it very much. Do you know what I mean? That somehow you get an instinct. So if a writer is a good writer, you almost don't have to act at all. Well, how often do you wind up on a TV show or something, and you don't need to name names, where the writing isn't very good? How do you elevate it? Well, most of the time, the writing is not great in, in network. Exactly. Shows. So what do you do? How do you work that? I don't try to find anything quirky. I actually try to find the simplest, most straightforward way of saying of saying something or just staying extremely real, I find. One thing, one thing I, I do know that I, I actually audition pretty well for stuff. I mean, there are a lot of wonderful actors who haven't had the opportunities that I've had because they have reading problems or they, you know, they don't audition well. I audition pretty well. I always memorize every, everything for an audition. I never go in to read. I've been blessed with a, with a quick memory. So I think that gets me a lot of jobs. Then, then you get the frustrating thing where you show up on the set and they said, your reading was terrific. You got a great job, but we don't want you to do anything like you did in the read. You gotta, that's what got me the job. Why don't you, you know, <laughs> is, is that, would you say that is your for lack of a better word, trick or tip in terms of auditioning is it's best to have it memorized when you go up. Absolutely. But nowadays it's getting harder and harder because they're giving you 15, 20, 30 pages sometimes. You know what I mean? And and what if you, I assume you've gone in and done cold reading where you couldn't memorize it. Yes. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a really good cold reader. I have to, I'm not boasting. I'm just saying I'm a really good. See, the thing is I, because you can see from my library, I spend almost all my days reading. I've been a voracious reader ever since I was a kid. So language is, comes rather naturally to me. So I can pretty much cold read. And that, that's a great blessing for an audition too. You're back to your notion of language being all, and you're a language hawk, a language freak. Even hawk, whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think for me, you're a memorable actor. I remember you in parts. Is there anything that you do to become memorable or are you just being you? I'm rarely me. I don't often play characters like myself. In fact, recently I auditioned for the role of an 80-year-old retired English professor who still writes papers, which I do, <laughs> which are proofread by his wife, which is also true. And I didn't get the part. And I didn't get the part. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't I don't have much success getting me. So um I do tend to use probably too many regional accents. You know, I'm speaking to you now and I almost don't know who you are because everything I've ever seen you in, there's some kind of a flavor of an accent in it. Yeah, yeah. I I do tend I think it's my um crutch and it's my weakness. It, it's a really good crutch. It's a really good crutch. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a really good crutch. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite things that you've ever done, and talk about language and great writers, truly great writers, classically great writers, is your scene with Haley Steinfeld in True Grit. Oh yeah, that was Holy that was mo- a dream. That was a dream. It was um it was <laughs> it was great working with the Cohn brothers and just the audition was funny because I auditioned on tape for it. And then I got a call. I'm going to tell this story about them. I got a call. I kept, you know, I didn't hear anything for months. They're, I think, notoriously slow casters, I'm, I'm guessing. I didn't hear anything. So I finally called my agent and I said, have we heard anything? Am I out of the running? What's going on? Because I felt I had submitted a pretty good tape. And uh, they said, uh, no, no, nothing yet. You, they, they want to know you're, you're still in the mix. You're still in the mix. This is like three months after I died. But they'd like you to do them a favor. And I thought, well, I'm going to turn down the favor. <laughs> what, what, what do they want? And they've narrowed the girls down to three, and they'd like you to come in and read opposite them. Wow. Okay. And it was me and Barry Pepper and uh, Jeff Bridges who were going to read scenes opposite these three girls. So I thought, well, okay, yeah, you know. I'll do them a favor. Maybe they'll do me a favor. So I show up on the lot and I go in and uh, I have heard nothing about the casting yet. I know I'm in the mix, but that's all I know. And I walk in and I'm immediately grabbed by this woman who says, oh, good, you're here. Come on in the next room. We want to get your measurements. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm, I'm just here to read opposite the new girls. I'm not really cast in the movie yet. And she goes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's how I knew that I got it. <laughs> they never said a thing during the whole process. The girls all read. And uh, after it was over, I, we didn't know if we were going to be asked our opinion, Jeff and Barry and I. But they sort of looked at us and asked our opinion. And we all went, the last one. Oh, well, she's spectacular in that yeah. movie. And still nothing. And then as I was leaving, I was walking away and I just waved at one of the, one of the Coen brothers and he said, See you in Santa Fe. That was it. That's all. That's all. <laughs> well, that's you know, isn't isn't that lovely when that happens? Well, yeah, you know, it's like if you're if, the other the other way. It sometimes happens if you're uh, if you if, if you've read for something and you don't know if you got it, but you think you're pretty close, and then you hear a slap on your front porch and a script hits the porch, then then you know you've got or you get a costume call. Then you know you sometimes they don't actually call you and tell you so you know it's nice when life works out that way (laughs) you (laughs) have worked on both lots of dramas and lots of comedies do you have a preference well this sounds odd but uh, but the middle part of my my screen career was almost all sitcoms and i and i really enjoy sitcoms not because not because the writing is always great though i've been very fortunate to work with some really on some really good ones, I think, but because it's most like theater. Before a live and, audience. And you have to work fast. I mean, you come in on Monday, you read a script, uh, you go home and come in on Tuesday, it's a completely different script. And you sort of block the whole thing and you go home and you come back in on Wednesday and it's a completely different script again, you know? So you really have to be in your toes. And I love, I love having to work hard. I love having to work fast. Uh, I, I am, I'm what, what my detractors call facile. <laughs> you, I guess you must be considering how much you've done. Do you but, but working like on? I worked on the on King of Queens, and Kevin is one of the most brilliant farcers, and uh, Kevin James. That was just a joy working because I thought he was so good. He and uh, he and uh, what's her name who played his wife were both terrific, terrific, and there were good writers on that show. I thought, and that was nice. Is and my it... very first long sitcom experience was a show that I did with Judy Ivy. That was also for for Ted Danson's company, which was also a real joy because I worked with some people who have become lifelong friends. We, we it was a really nice experience. So I do enjoy very what, much. What what show was that taken? That was Down Home with Judith Ivy and uh, uh, Getty Watanabe and uh, Eric Allen Kramer. It was a it was a terrific show. Do you like the notion? You've memorized the lines, of course. As you say, they then change them and change them right up to probably sometimes. Right I, up always, to yeah, I always, yeah, I always, I always learn them as fast. They you, now again, it's just I'm just I've just been very very fortunate uh, that after I read something maybe three times, I'm pretty much off book. 
do you like the notion of then not having to remember it again because you're done with it forever? Or do you prefer to to work on it night after night in the theater? Oh, I do keep working on it night after night. Yeah, that's, it, it, you never get everything. You know what I mean? So I, I always reserve a little bit, or I try to reserve a little bit, like a 5% of something. And I say, I didn't quite get that. I don't think. Some nights you don't get it. Some nights you do in the theater. And you say, let me see what I can tweak here to discover. And every once in a while, you'll make a discovery because you say, oh, I was pushing that line too hard. I just real one night I'd say, well, I won't push it that hard this time. I'll just take it, so I'll sort of throw it away. And it was better. So then now you incorporate that in your performance. I do even, I mean, I had never done a long run before I started doing Broadway and uh, long runs were, were tough, but, uh, but you do have to find a way to keep them fresh. What's the, what's the secret to that? What do you do? I just try to be in the moment at all times, but also I give myself the permission every once in a while to change things up a little mm -hmm. bit, not, mm -hmm. not in ways that will, you know, affect the other actors, particularly just my own, my own, my own choices sometimes. Well, you know? you've been in both, uh, uh, on Broadway, you've been in both dramas and in musicals. I mean, you did Waitress. Yeah, musicals. Where did that come from? Well, I, never... I was going to say, were you a singer prior to it? You know, I sang choir for 11 years, uh, you know, but that's hymns and hymns and polyphony and Gregorian chant. I did, did, no, I, <laughs> I was not a singer. My first, the first time that I did a couple of, you know, everybody does a little bit of singing. If you're working in the regional theater, I remember I, I did a play called Spoke Song a few years ago. And I did, uh, I did the Brendan's Beans, The Hostage. And I did a couple of musicals in college where you didn't have to sing that much. The first time it happened to me that I got a, I got a call from my agent saying, would you like to audition for a musical workshop in New York? And I thought, why me? Where, who, who, who made this contact? It turned out to be somebody I'd worked with years ago at the Mark Taper Forum. And I said, oh, I don't know, what do they want me to do? They said, well, they'd like you to just record a song. They'll send you a song. Would you record it? And would you send it back to them? And they'll listen to the tape. And I thought, well, that's not too hard, but I, I, I don't know how to do that. And they said, well, they have someone in town who will train you how to sing a Broadway song and, and do it. So I went to this woman, I made the tape, I sent it off. And my agent says, you know, they want to see you in New York. They're, they're willing to fly you out there to audition you again for this, this musical workshop. I was, okay, why not? So I, I went out and auditioned again, and they actually offered me the workshop. And it was uh, with Laura Benanti yes. and uh, Brian Darcy James, of all people. Two, are, two great Broadway performers. They were just beginning their careers. Uh, Laura was doing uh, The Music Man, I think, or Sound of Music, I think, at the age of 18. And Brian was doing something else. So I got, and I had two songs and a trio. And it was like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? The, the, the musical never went anywhere, but I had a ball. And then about 10 years later, my agent calls and says, would you be interested in doing a workshop of Rocky the Musical? And I said, that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> and everybody else who apparently was offered this workshop thought it was pretty dumb as well. <laughs> I said, it's just, a, it's the coach. It's not a singing part. They just need someone to play the coach. You played Mickey. And I said, I said, well, yeah, sure. I mean, I was between jobs. So I said, yeah, that'd be fun. So I went in and then about a, a couple of days later, they called it, but but take and they wonder, do you sing? Can you sing? And I said, well, I sang choir, you know, for a little bit. So Flaherty and Aarons wrote me a song, which was, and I got to sing a Flaherty and Aarons. And the same sort of thing happened with, with Waitress, you know. Uh, um, Sarah Bareilles. Sarah Bareilles wrote me a song for Waitress, so I'm, I'm not, a, not a singer. So it's, 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 it's flukish, as you could possibly imagine. Well, you know, Rex Harrison wasn't a singer either. Oh, that's true. And so you you performed your way through it more than you were perfect singing voice, you know. And no, I sang. I didn't sing speak. I sang <laughs> these songs. <laughs> I've I've heard it. I think you did excellent work. I learned some. I learned some of the chorus stuff as well. Do you come at a musical when you've gotten them differently as a performer than you do when you're doing, uh, for instance, To Kill a Mockingbird? Is your preparation different? Not not overwhelmingly, but the, the whole rehearsal process is so different. I mean, you have serious music rehearsals with serious 
musicians. I mean, I'm all that, that is one of the great joys of my life when I've started doing Broadway musical theater now. I've done a little bit, I've done a couple on Broadway and a couple in the encores thing. Uh, in one of them, I actually, in one of the encores in, where, in Where's Charlie, I actually had a little short song after they told me I didn't have any song. I had a little short song. But working with Broadway performers, singer, actor, dancers, especially the ensembles, is humbling and energizing. These young people are in such great shape. They're so multi talented. They can do anything thing they love what they do you know and uh, that's been one of the joys of my life is working in musicals but you you, you I, I you know I sang choir for many years but I, I can't sight read music and I'm not a, I, I don't have the trained voice so trying to keep up with these people has been that that's what sort of kept me it made me feel simultaneously very old and <laughs> kept me very young the, so the, the singer the singer dancer actors are actually athletes Oh, yeah, absolutely. They have to be. They have to be in unbelievable shape to be able yeah. to do that. Just yeah. the breath control alone to sing and dance. Stamina. And, you know, many of them began their careers learning three or four line, three or four roles, you know, because they were standbys and swings and understudies and stuff like that. So and during the pandemic, we really learned how important all those people were because of course. They, they were going on and playing all those roles. So, well, you you yourself have been an understudy in a, a number of shows that you've done, correct? Not too many, not too many. Um, I did understudy James Earl Jones in The Best Man. They offered me a little tiny role in The Best Man. It was, I think, it was my second Broadway show. They said it's 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 a little role, but and they want you to understudy James Earl Jones as well in one of the lead roles. And I thought, oh, I think I'll take this because I mean, how old is that guy? He's got to be in his eighties. He's surely going to miss one matinee or two. Not a chance. No, that was the rock of Gibraltar. But <laughs> what a joy to work with him and Angela Lansbury on on that show, and that was wonderful. So I have had to go on every once in a while under circumstances that's another story we were my my i did not have much of a new york career all those years that i was that i was working in the regions except again by accident i'm a kind of an accidental actor in that regard um i was going to graduate school to get my phd at nyu and i had begged john hausman for a job part-time teaching at juilliard where my wife was in group one, she was in the first class to go through the drama division. Right. And he gave me a little job um, teaching uh, theater history and doing some administrative work in the office so I could make a little bit of money and then go to my classes at NYU at night. And after doing this for a couple of years, they were bringing in somebody new to do some of the academic teaching because I taught some academics at Juilliard as well. And he said, he said, uh, I, I'm going to form a professional company when this class graduates, but I'm one character man short. So for your third year here, we'll have you still do some administrative work and teach a little bit, but we'd like you to sort of train with group one and become a member of the acting company when they graduate. So I was the ringer. I was the faculty ringer in that company. And, uh, but I, you know, I played a servant and a couple of servants and an old man and had a nice role in the hostage. But we opened finally in New York in September of 1972. And uh, our, our premier show was The School for Scandal, starring right. David Stiers and Mary Lou Rosado and Kevin Klein and Patti Lapone. It was the, it was, it was, it was the jewel in the crown. And um, about a week into the run, we were sitting around and somebody said, you know, we haven't had any understudy rehearsals. And I said, yeah, I know, but we all been doing this show. You know, we did it during the senior, their senior year. We were new. They said, well, maybe we should start thinking about it. So uh, Sam Chuchibus, who's been a lifelong friend of mine, said, well, why don't I understudy Sir Peter? And I said, well, actually, I think Sir Peter is in my contract. So maybe I better start learning it. So that night I learned the first act and a little bit of the second act. I just, in between the scenes where I was running off and on as a servant, I walked in the green room and just learned 
listened to it, learned the line. They'd been in my ears for a long time. So I'd, and the next morning uh, we got, we woke up around 10 o'clock and the phone rang and it says, Dakin, where are you? And he says, it's, uh, we're, we're home. He says, we've been trying to reach you. The, the, our Sir Peter has had it, uh, is out. He can't go on tonight. And we need you to go on as Sir Peter Teasel. We had never rehearsed any of the scenes. I had only started learning the role the night before. And I said, oh, okay, well, let me learn the rest of the second act and then I'll come in if we can have some rehearsal. I pretty much knew the blocking because I had seen the show and been in it. We could do a little blocking, Patty, and I had a chance to, to block one scene, I think, and I came in. And uh, that was the night that John Simon came. <laughs> the great and not necessarily nice critic, John yes, Simon. Yes, and uh, I went on as, I felt, I went on as, as Sir Peter, I muffed a few lines, I, I, I hardly can remember it. It was like, you know, a train passing by. Sure. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I did the lead in The Hostage, and I got two blazingly ra blazingly good reviews from John Sock. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I never wanted to do another play for him again, because don't <laughs> pressure luck. <laughs> well, he was notorious for ripping oh, shows. Oh. Yeah, he was he was he was a, he, he was brilliant and a great writer, but he was a he was a vicious. So man. you have also founded a number of companies, correct? Yeah, yeah. The the first one, well, well I founded one, two, I guess. The first one I, I started in about 1990 when when a number of us from the Bay Area had moved down to Hollywood to try to, you know, get some work in television and film, and we were doing okay get Spitzer, Spitzer, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, sometimes a little bit more. But we had, we, we had a four, we had a kind of a small society of Bay Area actors now living in, in Southern California, trying to get work and, and st but had all trained as classical actors and were feeling like, I'm not keeping up my skills. I'm not getting the rewards that I used to get by doing great plays. So I started a small company that didn't really intend to produce plays, but was a way for classical actors to continue to work on classical plays. Right. Uh, uh, and it's still running. It's you know, 20, almost 30 years later. This is, is this Antias? The Antias company, yeah. I no longer uh, run it. I'm st still a member, but it is. it still exists. And, and, and how challenging is it to have a full-time career as an actor and run a theater company? Not that bad because a full time career as an actor is not doesn't necessarily mean you work every day. True. It 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 means you probably work at, at maybe twenty six weeks out of the year. That would be great. I mean, if you're a Broadway actor, then you're working every day. Sure. But if you're if you're working in film and television, unless you're a, a regular on a sitcom or a regular on a series, you're not working every day particularly. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't. We only met every Monday night. You know, which is usually everybody's night off and would explore classical texts and tr train ourselves in, you know, movement or dance or something like that. But it has become a major player in the theater world in Los Angeles. In the small theater world in Los Angeles, it's one of the major, major small theaters. No yeah. question. And with a great, great reputation with fabulous actors and, and lots of great plays. Yeah. Um, yeah. W when did you decide to become a Shakespeare scholar? How did that happen? Uh, when I uh, when I was uh, going to my first time in graduate school at California State University, we used to call East Bay. Not, uh, it used to be called Cal State Hayward. I was fortunate that the that the department that that uh, they established there was full of Renaissance scholars, so they had a very heavy emphasis on Renaissance literature in that department. Mm -hmm. I had trained uh, heavily in medieval and and early Renaissance. Uh, philosophy and theology. So I pretty much knew the territory. And it, and then I started, I loved Shakespeare and I started acting in Shakespeare plays. So it sort of was kind of natural. Then when I shifted to NYU, I sort of began to especially uh, formally specialize in Shakespeare. And that it just sort of happened. So when and, you eventually go on to adapt Henry the Fourth, I find that word interesting only because it's already in English. You yeah. were translating it. What were you doing to adapt it? To shorten it? To truncate it? Or what were you doing to it? Well, um, I I first came across Henry the Fourth when I was studying in Italy, in graduate school in theology, 
And um, we used to, uh, the school I went to, which is called the American College, we used to put on a play every year, maybe two. And uh, it was my turn. It was my class's turn to do a play. So I, I, it was an all male school. It was a seminary. It was an all male school. So the limit, the number of plays you could do is pretty limited. You know, Julius Caesar, <laughs> he cut all the women out. And Henry IV, part one, if he cut all the women out. So I chose Henry IV, part one, uh, to, to uh, act in and direct. And we did it. And, and then I realized that there was a part two. Now, in the, the education I had up to this time, we had studied a Shakespeare play every year for six or seven years. Right. So I knew I knew Shakespeare's play somewhat in English, but I realized there was a part two because there's so much of at the end of part one, there's so much left unfinished. And I thought, there's a part two. So I read it. I remember, I remember lying on my bunk bed in in the in the dorm room thinking. Wow, there's a, this uh, part two finishes the story. I wonder if anybody's ever thought about putting them together and playing them together. I and see. I found out that somebody actually did that in 1630. Somebody <laughs> actually did put the two parts together into one. So I thought, well, that's an internet. So a few years, 10, 10 years later or so, someone asked me if I would put the two parts together into one. And I said, yeah, I think I'd like to. This was before computers. I mean, I was cutting up pieces of text and oh, wow. with scotch tape, you know, rather than, than no computers. So I started that. I really started that about almost 50 years ago. I started trying to adapt the two plays into a single evening, which would be about three, three and a half hours long. And I kept working at it. I brought my copy with, with the scotch taped stuff to New York with me when I went back to teach it at, at Juilliard. And I, I showed it to a, a, a colleague of my director colleague of mine. He said, oh, could, could I make a, a Xerox of that? I'd like to, you know, see. And then when I left Juilliard and came back to California, I got a call from a colleague of mine who said, oh no, I read in the paper. I read in the paper that the Goodman Theater had announced a production of my adaptation of Henry IV. Oh, oh. <laughs> I thought. I didn't hear. I never heard about this. <laughs> Did somebody tell me? Uh, so I began to check about it, and a friend of mine called me back. He said, "Oh yes, I know. I should have talked to you about this earlier." He was appointed the new director of the Goodman Theater, and he really had he really wanted. I said, "Well, how did you know about it?" He said, "Well, because we did it at Juilliard the year before." I said, "I didn't know that. Nobody told me that." What had happened is they, that this director had been directed a production of my adaptation at Juilliard with the, with the students. And it was, a, it was during a, a, a strike by all of the uh, scene workers. So it was done very bare bones and it was apparently a huge, a huge success script and, and taking it to the Goodman who wanted to do it and, asked, and finally asked me, would you come back for three or four days and be our playwright in residence? And I said, yeah, okay, sure. What but, is it about Shakespeare more than any other playwright in the history of playwriting or theater what is it about shakespeare that makes him so malleable that you can take and bring him into the modern world you can interpret him in so many different ways and i don't know if i mean maybe you do i don't know of any other playwrights that you can do that with not many not many yeah you can't try to imagine taking shaw out of his period it oh, just, exactly or moliere it's moliere moliere some people do it with moliere with some success i think it is not just the language. It's, it, it's his incredibly keen emotional intelligence about what makes people tick and his ability to accept people, to understand even people whom we should just hate so much that we don't want to understand them. Right. You know, he ended his career with, with plays about forgiveness and shared humanity basically the great romances are really all about forgive the worst things people do we're all in the same boat you know there will always be evil people and there will always be some good people and the good people won't always win and the bad people won't always lose except a life you know so that i think that's what it is is that given that it was an age of extreme um i mean it was, it was nearly a baroque baroque period the language was 
what could be extraordinarily difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the conventions of the theater, one of the, one of the advantages was that he didn't have to worry about sets. So he wrote as if there were no sets, which means you can add sets to it. The sets were never an extremely important part of the thing. So it's, it's, it's what Peter, Peter Brook calls the open, you know, the open space. It's just, it's a platform. Well, that's the most extraordinary thing about all these texts compared to anything else that you read. Yeah. He doesn't describe anything. He doesn't, he barely describes yeah. action and he barely describes any kind yeah. of back, yeah. background. So that, so that is one advantage that he had. The language, of course, can be difficult, but it is still, it is still modern English. It's early modern English, but it's still modern English. But given that there was so much, um, you know, formal pressure on him, to, to, to use a certain kind of language, a certain stylization, he still cut through it all to the heart of, of the human heart, basically. I think that's what it is. His characters are almost as fully rounded as people. They have internal lives almost as rich as actual people do. And that's why we identify with them. That's why we say, I, I want to that I can play that part because it's almost inexhaustible. It's almost like a real person. It's, it's, it's a, there's a mystery at the center of almost all of it. Even little characters have little mysteries at their center. And, and uh, that's what you want to do. You want to uncover that. And that makes him infinitely malleable. He, he, he just translates from generation to generation, unlike any other playwright. Well, it's not infinite, but it's 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 pretty close. It's not like you can do anything you want with Shakespeare. He was also an extremely proficient play constructor. Mm -hmm. he, he knew what he wanted. He knew what his characters meant when they said what they said. You can't just force any meaning on them that you might want, force any action on. He wrote, you know, he wrote really good machines. If you think of a play as a machine, or a, or a blueprint for a machine, you know what I mean? A, 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 it's really good. It really works. His plays work like crazy. So, so you don't. They're like they're like Swiss watches. Yeah, you don't you don't want to remove uh, parts, you know, or gum up the works. Particularly is what I what I say, you know. When you, you should, when you did your adaptation of Henry IV, were you concerned about that? That you would. I gum was it very up? concerned about that. I was very concerned about having as clear. A, a, a structure that the bones were good, not just the flesh. Do you know what I mean by that? Yes. That the bones of the play were there. So when I decided to adapt it, I wanted to make sure that each arc that he wrote, which was completed over two plays, was still completed and nothing essential of that arc was left out. And then that each act had a specific structure that was identifiable and you could hang the play on it. So I really. I really structured the three acts very, very carefully so that they were dramaturgically, um, uh, uh, they had good dramaturgical bones. Mm -hmm. just, just not throw any scene anywhere, but make sure the scenes still alternate the way he likes them to alternate, but they build to certain climaxes that are essential to the storytelling. Yeah, so your, the first play that you did, you said was was Shakespeare, was Henry the Fourth back then correct one of the first plays i ever did was Henry and Ford. so did you have an innate understanding of that language which was is not you know modern language at all it's got a, a certain thing to it that's not that, mo yeah. modern i came to it i mean i don't say i had an innate language but again as i say it was a voracious reader i had read literature in in a, in a large number of periods you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh, I remember, well, you, we used to grow up we grew up i grew up you know, sometimes reading Sir Walter Scott when you were 13 or 14 years oh, old. Wow. Okay. You know I mean? So, I mean, because he was the, he was the adventure writer, Robert Louis Stevenson. When you're trained classically, you do tend to read uh, works from different periods, different eras. It's hard to get kids nowadays to read uh, books out of their immediate ken, if you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. It was not a chore for me to read Shakespeare, but you do have to pay attention. It, you do have to sort of get. I that. I personally have a problem with Shakespeare. I have always I don't know what it is. I have trouble understanding a certain amount of it, and I have to work at it to get work my way through it. I have to. It's it's a 
it's almost a little bit of a struggle. And I know many people do have that struggle. Yeah, that it you... depends on it depends on the play. I have a struggle getting through some of them as well. I mean, some of them are really, really dense. The opening scene of Cymbeline, you just I just you have, to, you have to keep looking at looking and looking, <laughs> trying to figure out what are these people saying? Because in some place he is writing in the in the language of his period and in the sort of clipped, you know, uh, not entirely uh, fully structured grammar of the period. So that happens. But you read something from Midsummer Night's Dream, those four kids in Midsummer Night's Dream, they could be teenagers coming off the street right now. Their language is transparent. So you're you're also a translator. You, what language do you translate? From Italian? Is that your language? I, I can translate from Italian. I've done a couple. I've done some uh, Goldoni and some Pirandello. Um, I translate uh, from Latin. Wow, Latin. I translate a little bit from Greek. I did study Greek for many years. I don't, I don't really, I'm not fluent at all in written Greek. But if you give me a book of Greek and, and a dictionary and, and notes, I can work my way through a Greek passage. But the last uh, 15 years, I've been translating from Spanish. Spanish? Mostly, yeah. The Golden Age plays. Uh, Explain for the listener what the difference is between a transliteration and a translation. A transliteration tries to translate the exact words of the author uh, as clearly and as faithfully as possible. A translator tries to write in, in his own language and the language of his readers as close an approximation of what that writer would write if he were writing in that language. So you can transliterate, for example, the Golden Age plays that I translate, which is the period from 1550 to say 1680. Thousands of plays were written in that period in Spain. Every town in Spain had its own theater and some had more than one. There's many more than that are of Elizabethan and Jacobean plays. Very few of them come onto the Anglophone market, as we say. Um, but they're all written in rhyming verse, every one of them. They're kind of standardized. They're a little formal, you know, and the characters are not terribly deep and the plots are very complicated but repetitive and all that sort of stuff but some of them are great but rhyme is essential to it so if you're going to translate for me you have to translate from rhyme to rhyme if you transliterate you're just going for the meaning and the, and, it, and won't, it, it won't it won't necessarily it, rhyme at all correct it may not rhyme at all and it may not be playable because if you're translating a comedy comic rhythms are part of the, the original author's intention. Sure. Transliterate does not necessarily catch the rhythms of the original. So a good verse translator and a good play translator will try to produce a producible version of the play that honors also its rhymes. And that's what I've been doing for about 15 years. That's amazing. Am I, correct me if you think I'm wrong, please. Um, that a translator is actually both a transliterator and an adapter is what you're doing. You're adapting it so that it has a feeling of naturalness to it. Well, I'm not, I'm trying to adapt as little as possible. I'm actually, an adapter will then go in and cut certain speeches mm -hmm. because they're too long, you know, conflate characters like I did for the Henry Fours. I cut cut a lot of speeches. I cut almost half the speeches in the play in the two plays. I adapted characters, changed characters' names, conflated characters, rearranged scenes, things like that. That's what adaptation is. Some people call it transadaptation, which is you translate. But for me, the first time I make a translate, I translate everything, and I don't try to do any cutting or adapting. I tried as much as possible to get the flavor of the original. Now, this is very difficult when you're with comedy because what's funny then is not funny now. Of course. So you some or, or an illusion that works then may not lose work now because you don't know who it is. So you do a certain amount of adapting. You adapt the jokes so that they still work. You adapt the illusions so that people still know. So instead of talking about a couple of Spanish lovers we never heard of, you might put in Romeo and Juliet or Pyramus and Thisbe. You know what I mean? So you do a, a certain amount of adapting, but I try to do as little as possible, though having to go into verse, rhyming verse is very difficult because English is so rhyme poor because it doesn't inflect, it doesn't have endings. 
So it's very rhyme poor. So explain explain only, that. What do you mean by it doesn't have endings? Well, most foreign languages, especially like Spanish, the verbs all conjugate and the nouns all decline. So they all have similar endings. So it's easier to rhyme. It's much that. easier to rhyme. English has pretty much lost all its conjugations and declensions. So you just get the word roots as they are. And for example, you want to write a play about love. There's only about 11 words, if, if that many, that rhyme with love, as Stephen Sondheim points out. So yes. it's the worst word in the world to have to write rhyming songs or verses about. Yes. You know. it's, it's, it's a miracle that the English language works at all. I know. And there's only been two great periods, a couple of great periods of rhyme in the English language. And that was back in the early English when it did have endings and you could rhyme. And then in the Victorian, in the in the Romantic and Victorian, when people like Browning were and Keats and Shelley and Coleridge and, and uh, Wordsworth were working, they were they were working really well at rhyme. What is the difference between what you're talking about in terms of translating and being a dramaturge on something that's an existing English play where you're not translating anything. What does a dramaturge do? Well, I, uh, yeah, uh, many dramaturges have, have, have one of two jobs. They work as literary managers in the theater, which is to say they uh, consult with the artistic director on what plays would be good in the next season. And they also generally manage the new plays program, which is to say what new scripts are out there that we should be interested in. That's sort of the traditional German dramaturg. Yeah. He's a theater administrator who is a literary expert, but also knows what's going on in the play world and where the new scripts are. And if you give him a play from the repertoire, an older play, he knows what it, how it works and what its bones are and what the history of it is. The second kind of pe person, which is what I mostly do, which is a dramaturge, I call it, a dramaturge, consults on a single production because he's maybe an expert in that playwright or in that play or in that period. So he can do anything from supplying background material to the director or the actors for what they need to know about the background of the play. He can consult with the director about how to cut the play better, maybe even how to cast the play. And uh, he can uh, work on, uh, in some cases, he can work in the room with actors. Now that doesn't happen very much. Usually he's supplying background material, writing program notes, helping the director to understand the structure of the play. Help. I was very, very fortunate as I was an actor before I was a dramaturge. Mm -hmm. So I know how to talk to actors without scaring the pants off them. You know, <laughs> I can speak their own language. So the directors I've worked with as a dramaturge, which has been almost exclusively in Shakespeare, after a couple of stints as a literary manager finding new plays, uh, I'm usually uh, available to speak to the actors during that first week of rehearsal when there's table work. So I can I can unpack the language for them, tell them what this means. Uh, my my most common experience with actors when I after I've cut a play is they come to me and they say, "You cut the most important lines that my character has." <laughs> it always happens. They always happen. they will always go to the full script. They will find some lines that say, "I built my entire character on those lines, and you cut those." <laughs> <laughs> so I say, okay, what lines do you want to give up so you can have those back? But Am I correct that there are some dramaturges that will work with new plays, new playwrights, new plays? Yes, to, that's, to, the other, to help that's, that's that other guy back there, the one who's attached to a theater and helps run their new play program. He's He supposedly or she supposedly has expertise in how plays are constructed and what makes plays work and what keeps them from working and therefore they will help a director and a playwright find out where the strengths of the play are and where the weaknesses are and maybe how to repair them basically I, i've been having the most fabulous conversation with Dakin matthews for a little more than an hour at this point and we're going to wind the show down a, a bit so i'm wondering if you do have a single solid piece of advice that you like to give people when they're sort of starting out or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to get to the next level. What do you like to tell people? 
Okay, I'm often asked, you know, by parents who have kids who are interested in being in the industry or by young actors themselves, what I advise. And I first say, first of all, my career is so weird that my career path is not available to anyone anymore. So don't worry about that. What I tell kids who are in high school is I say, my advice to you is go to college two year, four year, doesn't matter. And don't major in drama, major in a liberal art or a science, political science, English, history, music, anything, anything you want. And at the same time, audition for every single role in the drama department. If you can graduate with a degree in the liberal arts, which will prepare you for your future life, and you were cast in a number of plays in the drama department without being a member of the drama department, then you may have a future in theater. Then consider a conservatory. The, the, the education you get in the liberal arts will not only prepare you for life, it will prepare you for theater as well. You will learn to write, you will learn to read, you will learn history, you will learn how to research. You'll be well prepared for theater. And your natural talent, which you've shown you have by the fact that you got cast in a number of plays, will, will serve you well when you go to conservatory unless you're absolutely gorgeous or absolutely handsome. <laughs> then you could probably go to Hollywood and become a star. <laughs> that advice doesn't count for anybody who's absolutely gorgeous. If you are absolutely gorgeous or absolutely handsome, which is what, say, Kevin Klein was or Jessica Chastain is, they still went the conservatory route. They still went to college first and then to a conservatory, I think and are now major stars. So it works It works if you're handsome and gorgeous to get conservatory training, but you may not need it if well, you're gorgeous. You're yeah. saying something really important and incredibly wise, that the expanded educational background is very important to a, a, the longevity of a career. But at the same time, even if you're not in the specific field of training as an actor, you're still acting, which means that's a form of training just by doing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The second thing is, once you are started, never give up the habit of reading. Never give it up. Watch as many movies as you want. Watch as many plays as you want. Do watch good movies and go watch good plays and do watch good television. And you'll always learn something by watching good actors act. But you're you never, never give up reading. Don't spend all your time on the set doing crossword puzzles and gossiping constantly read, constantly expand your mind because it will expand your understanding of human nature. And, and that's what actors really, they have to become not only athletes of emotion, but athletes of the psyche. They have to understand what makes people tick. You know, there's that famous story about a kid who goes to the library and says, do you have any magic books here? And the librarian says, well, 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 what do you mean? You know, the kind when you open them, that the, the whole world in there that just suddenly appears, it's just, yeah, we do, all of them. <laughs> well, I, I don't I haven't spoken to anyone on this show in all the years I've been doing it who's as deep and wide as you are in terms of your your breadth of knowledge. It's oh good. I thought you were talking about my size. Not here. your physical size, like, David. Avoir du poids, or your, I have to say my ever du poise. Your 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 the breadth and depth of your knowledge, not your not your physicality, which is <laughs> fine all by itself. I'm David, working on I'm working on that. Dakin, this has been one of the most fun shows I've ever done. I really have enjoyed chatting with you today, and I can't, I can't thank you enough for being on with me today. Okay, well, my pleasure. And by the way, my Henry Four is being re restaged again at theater for a new audience next year, I think, in New York. So, that's I'm looking forward to that. So everyone should check that out when it comes out, so you can actually see um, an award-winning. Ad adaptation of Shakespeare, which is fairly unusual to see yeah. Shakespeare adapted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this has been terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great story beat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.